My name is Bob Hooper. I was teaching courses here for almost 50 years. I came here on a one-year one contract with Memorial University to be a research assistant on a, a project to examine the, what kind of seaweeds lived in, in Newfoundland. The one year went by entirely too quickly and I came to Bombay in October of the first year, which pretty well meant that I was glued to Newfoundland for the rest of my life. After the first couple of years, I used to start my introduction to the students by saying, now I should warn you, you're in day one of this course in Bombay, and if you stay here for more than two weeks, you'll be addicted for the rest of your life. Well, it wasn't really a station at the, when I first came here. It was, it was an old outboard house that was being used as a shore base for this plankton study on the entire, for the entire Gulf of St. Lawrence. The guy that was doing the, the sampling work was, was a fellow by the name of Frank Murphy. And so for the summer months, he lived in the house with his family. So it was, it was a family accommodation. And uh, on the main floor of the building, they had set up some labs so you could run uh, pumps to uh, filter out the plankton from, from the water samples. And, and you could do rudimentary water chemistry on the, on the water samples. One of the bedrooms on the, on the upper floor had been turned into a, a small kitchen. We started having students coming out here on field trips on the midterm breaks and other, other times like that. One of the things that, which was very apparent is if you turned up with 20 or so students, a small outboard house became very, very cramped. So the, the need for more space and more facilities uh, sort of hit you in the face. Like we had three, one, two, three, four bedrooms and we would cram four students into each of the four bedrooms. And then we had students sleeping on a couch in the living room. And we had other students camping in little tents around <laughs> the station. And there was no room in any of the, of the bedrooms for faculty. So the faculty all slept in the net loft. So the, the, shed, the shed alongside of the wharf, the, the ground floor was where we kept our outboard motors and pumps and and field equipment and stuff like that, diving stuff. And the upstairs is where we had all the nets and other field equipment. And so we would put our sleeping bags on pile, tops of piles of nets for, for, the, for the instructors. It was so much fun that you didn't notice the discomfort. I can remember a couple of the faculty members sleeping in down mummy bags, a layer of frost, maybe up half to, to half an inch thick from their, from their freezing breath because there was no heat in there. We, we dreamed, of, we dreamed of, a, of a station like we have now. And when did the current marine station, when did, when did that come about? This was uh, funded around 2000, year 2000. The enthusiasm of children for the things we were keeping in aquarium was, was sort of where the idea of developing tourism here came from in the first place. I, I would be doing research with snow crabs or whatever other kind of organisms and have them in, in my primitive research tanks in the old station. And we were always having to uh, basically keep little kids from falling in because they were all so curious and so enthusiastic. And that was what convinced Colleen Kennedy and various other people that we should be pursuing the potential for being a tourist attraction because even when we weren't trying to be a tourist attraction all the little kids were in danger of falling into our tanks all the time because they were so excited by the, the things that were swimming around in the tanks and uh, finally Colleen Kennedy of Bruce Martin Co-op and uh, Eden Kiernan of the university 
put through a proposal that depended on combining tourism as part of the mix so that we would have a public aquarium and we would be part of the developing tourist community in Chris Morn, in addition to the teaching and research which we had always done. It's, it's kind of ironic that the university would never have such a fine teaching facility uh, if it wasn't for our tour, tourism. So we, we've been in trade and I, and I think it's been wonderful. There are times where fish harvesters might find something unusual. Has a harvester ever brought in something that's particularly interesting? We've gotten most excited with some of the things they get in deep water when, they're, when they've got their nets out offshore for the turbot and uh, some of the other deeper, deeper creatures. So sometimes they would bring in a uh, little octopi, octopus. Uh, they're, they've got a cool name, they're called bathypolypus and uh, they, they live below uh, 200 meters in the Eskimo Channel out in the Gulf. And so we've, we've had fishermen bring those in. They're really, really cute. And uh, on the same sort of habitat, we get little uh, soft corals. It's some, some that look like little sea fans, and some that look like pens, feather pens. What we used to see traveling in the same sort of company with them was uh, leatherback turtles. You know, great, gigantic, huge turtles. I think they're one of my favorite animals. They, they can weigh over a thousand pounds and they are just so cute. The cuteness is probably what started most biologists. <laughs> what do you think makes Bon Bay so special for you? Well, being a marine biologist and a marine ecologist, I'm particularly interested in why, well, every, every biologist is interested in why things grow where they do, live where they do. The fact that I was seeing Arctic species here that weren't supposed to be living outside the Arctic really caught my attention. And then I found it particularly uh, curious that there were all these temperate species here at the same time and you'd find Arctic sponges right alongside temperate sponges, you'd find uh, Arctic kelps right alongside relatively temperate kelps. And same with the all the plants and animals. There's this juxtaposition of warm water species and cold water species. So uh, I was very surprised by that. I wanted to find out why. Well, I'd come out here to help a research assistant who was working on a project for McGill University. and. He was looking for somebody to give him a hand with the sampling. The deal we made was that I would come out to Bond Bay with him and help him with his plankton sampling. And then he would uh, allow me to go have time to do some diving. The very first dive was right off the wharf here. Uh, and because we had the, the, the fishing store, the, the old fisherman's store, right next to the wharf, so that seemed to be the sensible place to go. So I was struck by the, the plants and animals that I was seeing. I've dived pretty well every corner of Newfoundland, much of Labrador. Close to half the diving I've done has been in Bond Bay, so there isn't an inch of the Bond Bay coast, especially in the East Arm, where I haven't dived. And uh, I find that although my priority is biology, I don't have any trouble getting non-biological divers addicted to Bond Bay and never wanting to keep on coming back again and again. The headland of uh, Gads Point is uh, on the charts as Bond Bay Narrows, but people who dive in the area tend to call it the wall because there is a drop off from just near the the navigation light on Gads, Gads Point that uh, drops vertically for 260 feet, I think. It's like having an elevator to see the various floors in a department store. So you, you go in and it's uh, warm, warm water, seaweeds and 
lobsters and so on. And then next level down, uh, various kinds of sea anemones and, and other creatures. And you get a little bit deeper and you're into soft corals. You get a little bit deeper and you're into things like brittle, brittle stars, uh, basket stars. And it's just gorgeous there. They're very, every color, lots of red and orange and yellow and pink things. And beautiful, graceful kelps. You can actually see the levels in the seawater that were uh, detritus marks boundaries of increasing salinity and decreasing temperature. So that you'll, you'll, you'll in the shallow water, you'll see cunners and uh, maybe a little herring or things, the other shallow water species. You get a little bit deeper, you start seeing codfish. You might see schools of pollock. We used to get down to 35 and 40 meters and we'd see codfish that were over 100 pounds. And uh, in fact, the first one I saw of those saw me before I saw him because the little cod are quite shy, but the big ones are not. And uh, I was diving on the wall, taking pictures one, one day in the early 70s. And wham, I got knocked head over heels. And I thought the person I was diving with was being funny. She was actually about 50 feet away from me and her eyes looked like saucers. And it obviously hadn't been her. So I looked around and I saw what looked like a little codfish swimming straight towards me. And I realized that the closer it got, the bigger it got. And by the time, by the time it struck my leg again, it was almost as big as I was. It had been attracted to the flashing of the knife attached to my leg. The cod thought it was a cod, a cod jigger <laughs> and smacked me again, except uh, this time I wasn't so surprised. One of the things that I found amusing when I was first diving here in the first few years was how we would practically always come back at the end of a dive with something we were going to eat. And the response from the old men on the wharf who always wanted to see what you were brought back it was always, you're just not going to eat that, is you? And that was usually be followed after five or ten minutes of disparagement of, you know, everybody knows that it's not fit to eat. And that would be something like a snow crab or a, or a, a ocean quahog. hog. Uh, you know, you're just not going to eat that, is you? Then, how do you cook it? <laughs> and so we found that uh, I think we influenced uh, consumption of food quite a lot. What is it that keeps bringing you back to Norris Point? Friends, primarily, the view, the fact that I enjoy gardening, and uh, and memories, I suppose. And just the community just is part of me. <laughs>